Hello, Isopod fans. We are live. This is going to be a fun session tonight. Let me first make sure that you can hear me and everything looks good in this room. Hopefully everything looks good. Hopefully you can hear me. Somebody give me a huge thumbs up. Uh, Nanette, thanks for joining me tonight. You're welcome. This is going to be fun. I've been getting a ton of questions about the substrate. I've done two or three videos on making your own substrate, and I've got some really, really key points in this uh, chat, but I want to make this very live. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. This is going to be 51% me and Nanette, and it's going to be 49% you. So let me know if you have questions. And if you have questions, proceed with the word question, uh, put at Supreme Gecko, or just type in all caps. Do I have a thumbs up for the sound and the lighting and everything? Do we look okay? Are we live? We have a bit of an echo. Somebody said we have a bit of an echo. Okay, just a little bit or a lot. <clears throat> I don't know if I can do anything about that. Maybe I'm talking too loud. Let me try this. Bear with me here. Let's see if that helps. If that's worse, let me know right away. Um, I'm just going to go through the list here. We have Jennifer. We have Barbara. We have Veronica. V. Barry. We have Barbara. We have Frank the Tank. Jennifer. Did I say we have yes. Jennifer here? Let's see who else. I can't see how many people have joined so far. We're going to wait a couple of minutes before we really kick into this. Scott. Scott's Animal Adventures, I think it's like 2 o'clock in the morning there, so I doubt no that he's... What's that? No way. Yeah. He's over in uh, the great UK. We have Cat V here. Something. What's that? Go up. I think you missed somebody. Oh, I'm sure I missed somebody. Toby. Oh, Toby's Exotics. Thank you very much for joining me. So Toby's Exotics is a great channel. I just I they haven't had much time to watch. I was hoping to get some uh, watch time on YouTube today. Just haven't gotten there but certainly watch one of his videos and that uh, looks really, really cool. Great YouTube channel. So visit Toby's, Toby's Exotics. Let's see. Critters. Uh, critters and more. Thank you, Nanette. I'm kind of missing this stuff. You know what? I'm just glad that I'm wearing my shirt right side out. Um, yesterday, I, I hope so, is it? I think it is. Uh, yesterday, walking down to the uh, bus stop with Crystal. You did not. I did. I did. So the bus stop is only Crystal and I and a neighbor down the street and, and their young boy. So it wasn't too bad. She goes, oh, are you going to take it off and change and, and flip it around? I said, no, that would be way more embarrassing than wearing it inside out. And nobody noticed. So I did a lot of you know stuff like this, covering up my buttons so nobody would see that they were inside out. We have Angie. Good. Angie just joined and hopefully she didn't catch that, that uh, story. I hope she did. <laughs> Somebody let me know. How is the sound now? Is it any better? Is it worse? As long as you can hear me and it's not too bad, we'll keep going on. And this is going to be, you know, I always say it's going to be 20 or 30 minutes, but there's going to be a ton of information in this, in this live stream. And I'm going to be looking all over the place. So uh, Barbara says, my son is a YouTube hog. I usually don't get to watch until he goes to sleep. Uh, sound is good. Sound is good. Thank you. It's awful. Just awful. It's a, Seriously, is it awful? Um, <laughs> no. I just want to know for Angie. sure. I know it's Angie, but I, I really want to make sure that this uh, the sound is and everything is good. Uh, be very good. Wait. You can hear me. Not, wait. Uh, remember that T-Mobile commercial. I so Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Um, I think we're all set. <laughs> I, I don't want to delay too much because we hate Wally's voice. Let's hear into that. Oh, I, I completely <laughs> agree with that. Um, tons of information. So we're going to be talking about isopod substrate today. And it's a really super important uh, piece of information on keeping isopods. So I'm going to see if I can find that one post I had. Maybe not. Um, the substrate is probably the most important thing about keeping isopods. The most important thing that you can do for your isopods. It's kind of like, well, it's kind of like keeping fish and not worrying about the water quality. I'm just going to fill their tank. It's going to evaporate. I'm going to have to put more water in every couple of weeks. 
It's way more than that. Way more than that. Um, it's very, very important. I'm just going to say hi to Dinosaur17 and uh, Gamma11. And I thought we had somebody else show up here. Uh, Mr. J, thank you very much for joining us. So isopod substrate, I think, is the most important thing that you can do for your isopods. We can talk food all day long. We can talk about the wood that you use. We can talk about all kinds of different things. But the substrate is the starting point. If you get that wrong, your culture won't thrive, certainly, and it might not even survive. So substrate is the thing that you want to, want to spend the most time on. And I, I see this on Facebook all the time. Hey, can I feed my isopods uh, dead crickets? Can I feed my isopods canned peaches? Uh, just all kinds yeah. of weird stuff. Just all kinds canned of weird stuff. Peaches? I, I don't know. I'm, I think I'm making... Can I feed my isopods dog food? Yeah. But I don't really see that much information about um, asking questions about the substrate. It's so important. So what makes the best substrate? So I could literally stop the whole session right now with two words. I could say two words and we could say, good night, everybody. Have a good time. See you next live stream. You could never do that. I, yeah, I, I kind of can't do that, can I? But I want to start with, uh, um, I'll catch that in just a second, Angie, about the soil that you brought uh, back from up north. So the best substrate. So if you looked at the title of the, the thumbnail, it wasn't how to make the best substrate. How to make the best substrate is a really, really easy answer. And it's about flake soil. If you don't know about flake soil, flake soil is taking um, wood chips and other debris found in nature, putting it in, put, putting them through a process that breaks down, starts to break down the um, natural organic components. And I, I want, I'm hedging my words because I, because I want to say it right. And if we could get a conversation with Sean Kramer of U.S. Invertebrates, uh, and I'm hoping that we can at some point, uh, he could explain this a lot better than I can. But it's it's in it's a soil that's being broken down already, already decomposing. So we're going to talk today about going to uh, Home Depot or Menards or your home improvement store, grabbing a 40-pound bag of $6 soil and starting with that. And that's okay. It's And we're going to talk about other ingredients that will make it better. But ultimately, if you want the best soil, the best soil is flake soil. Do I use flake soil? No, I don't. I don't use flake soil because it's kind of pricey. And for some of the animals that I'm keeping, it's really not, my opinion, it's not going to make as much of a difference that the price uh, constitutes. Um, I think if you're working with some very expensive isopods, you probably should consider, um, you should consider thinking about using flake soil because it's that much better. Now, another, uh, another soil, I shouldn't even say soil, another dirt. component, I don't even want to say dirt, uh, another component to that a lot of people use is ABG mix. And I always get that wrong. I always say AGB. It's ABG mix. And ABG mix, I get the, the list right here. ABG mix is sphagnum moss, one part of sphagnum moss, two parts of tree fir, tree fern fiber, two parts of orchid bark, one part peat moss, and one part charcoal. So it's a really, really good mix, and it's a really, really good mix for bioactive substrate where you're, where you're, where you have um, springtails and just basic isopods like powder blues or something like that. I don't think ABG mix is a great or a better substrate for the isopods that we usually keep. You know, if you're using uh, a substrate for your basic isopods like uh, giant canyons, like uh, I don't want to throw dwarf whites in there because they burrow and they're different, but some of the more basic dairy cows. Uh, if you're using a substrate for some of these animals that have very, very low requirements, you can pretty much get away with anything that you can think of. Now, I had 
powder blues in a container once for probably a month because I had taken out other uh, isopods and those powder blues had gotten into the, the enclosure. I took out the other ones. I just set the, the container on the side because there were probably 10 or 12 different powder blues in there. Set it aside for a month. Uh, the substrate was a little bit damp. And when I looked at it a month later, when I checked it a month later, those powder blues were just fine. And there was very, very little uh, moisture in any of the, the substrate. And that substrate was way, way gone. So um, I think that there's some uh, isopods that are okay in just about anything that you can mix together. But, you know, if you're keeping something like some of the arvodolidiums, some of the higher, especially the higher end porcellos like the Expanses and the Bolivare, Hoffman Sega, you, you certainly need a better substrate. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, so ABG is a good mix, but I wouldn't use it as a better substrate for some of the more advanced isopods that we have. Um, I talked about flake soil. Flake soil is a great substrate. It's just, I think, um, a little bit of overkill for some of the isopods that we're keeping, but it's absolutely the best thing that you can do if you're keeping millipedes. And this isn't about millipedes, and I'm not going to go off on that path, but if you're keeping millipedes, you really should consider getting flake soil. And I do. I have my millipedes on flake soil, again, from uh, U.S. Invertebrates. So um, I think that that's something that everybody needs to consider. We're having popcorn today. Who's having popcorn? Somebody's having that? popcorn and having having enjoying popcorn. the show. Have you butter? Wow. Yeah. Um, it says up there, same here, having popcorn. Up higher. Um, I need chocolate. Oh, now I'm gone. I, you know, <laughs> squirrel. squirrel. <laughs> uh, Andrew says, I want a big millipede, like a major millipede. Uh, that would be cool. I'm one of the African giganticus. giganticus. Um, so there's going to be some topics that we're going to exclude from this conversation. We're not going to talk about the decor. We're not going to talk about the tub size in relationship to isopods. We're not going to talk about ventilation. We're not going to talk about stuff like that. We're just going to leave that stuff out of the mix. Simply because I want to talk about substrate, kind of keep this under six or seven hours. Now, hopefully we'll not go that long. I mentioned before that this is not just me. If you have ideas, if you have um, concerns about the substrates that you're using for your isopods, chime in, let me know. I want to make sure that we get all the questions answered. I keep grabbing the wrong mouse. Oops. I keep grabbing the wrong mouse here. Uh, Angie, I wanted to show your stuff, but I also wanted to say hi to JP's Lizard World. Um, so if you have questions, Hit the questions up. Okay, so V. Berry says, should I put calcium in our pack chong and rubber ducky substrate? I'm going to get to that. When I talk about calcium, uh, make sure that you bring that question up again. Um, I mentioned bioactive. Um, so this is kind of like your stuff, your comments. Uh, that's okay, Angie. Uh, I'll try to show your stuff whenever I can. Um, so for bioactive, what we're going to talk about is absolutely going to work for any bioactive setup whatsoever. If it's good for these isopods, it's going to be for a, great for a bioactive. It's going to hold moisture, and that's another component of this whole what kind of, uh, what's the best substrate. You want something that's going to hold moisture. It's not going to compact. You want something that's going to be good for the isopods long term as far as nutrition. Remember, these are ditrivores, so they eat decaying materials. So that substrate, if you took, take dirt or ABG mix or something like that, that's going to last a while. But I tell you what, if you add in some other, um, I'm trying to find a question here. I'm going to get to this one like real quick. If you add in all these other components, it's going to last longer and longer. And, and we're going to get to some of those points in just a second. Um, what else? Uh, I mentioned low compaction rate. You really don't want a substrate. And that's the reason we don't just use dirt in our substrates, because that compacts down. It's hard for the isopods to get into. Isopods, a lot of isopods burrow, especially the, man the mankey. 
Uh, the babies will burrow down into the substrate and need something that they can dig into. Uh, let's talk about the ingredients of mouth trick. We've got a couple of questions here. Mouth trick. Do that mouth trick. What was the mouth trick? Like that? Is that what I did? Um, I don't know. So let's talk about the ingredients. And again, if you have a question about a specific ingredient, bring it up because I want to make sure I get to all these questions. I'm afraid I'm going to miss out on a couple here. So if I talk about an ingredient and I don't cover your question, make sure that you bring it back up again, please. And uh, I'm going to get that question off. Um, and I'm going to show this one so I don't lose track of that because we're going to talk about that right now toby's exotics um let's talk about the number one ingredient for substrates and that's the dirt that's the soil that's the the main ingredient and i'm going to go through just kind of a list i put together some substrate you're just kind of playing around like you're in I'm a just sandbox it here um just breaking it up so what i did was i pulled a bag of our um dirt and we're using Oh, gosh, uh, just natural dirt. And there's a lot of dirts, dirts, worm castings, a lot of dirts that are really good. Obviously, you don't want something like sand. I'm not a fan at all about, at all about using like a koi fiber or a peat moss uh, base. You want something that's going to be like 60 to 70% of your mix, and you really, really, really want a um you want a dirt uh component to make that up again i mentioned that we use just uh natural uh there's a there's a oh gosh a c something um if you have a question about which kinds of dirts are good the one thing that you want to make sure is that you don't have additional um uh, additives like fertilizers or something mm -hmm. like that uh, what is your opinion on Zoomed uh, creature soil for ice spots? I haven't tried that. Uh, I haven't tried that. Um, I'm not too familiar with it. I haven't heard anybody using it. I guess I would need to look at that. I'll probably look at that after the stream tonight to see what's all in that. Um, how often should you... I'm going to pull this up and then we're going to get to that dirt question, but how often do I change out my substrates? I change out my substrates when I have so many animals in the enclosure that I start seeing some die off. That's because they've used up the resources. Or if the, the enclosure gets to be about seven, eight, nine months old, even if I don't see any die offs, even if it's a smaller collection of isopods, I tend to then go ahead and change the substrate right out. Um, it really is a feel thing. You really have to kind of watch the, the number of isopods that you have, the size. Uh, giant canyons, they burrow. They're going to use up the nutrients of that substrate quick. And you're going to look at that container and go, oh, there's 20 or 30 in there. And actually, there's 14,000 buried somewhere in the substrate, and they're just using up the nutrients. You've got to get that, that substrate changed out. I change out the giant canyons probably more frequently than, than most any of the isopods that I keep. Um, so Frank says it's literally just peat moss and creature soil. I don't know what creature soil is, unfortunately. Um, said, yep, I also have a question on a brand of soil with isopods. Have you had any experience with Arcadian's Earth Pro? Seems to be really good, but I don't know. I haven't used that either. Again, for dirt, for soil. So we're talking about substrate and there's a lot of components to substrate i'm going to get to some of these other components that you should be adding if you want to go out and get a pre-mixed substrate that's really cool this hopefully will help you avoid uh paying for a lot of these different materials that you can just go out and source yourself and put in your own uh substrate that's my feeling so I know Permian Exotics has a really, really good substrate. There's other really good substrates. Again, U.S. Invertebrates has a really, really good substrate. This is more about kind of creating your own from a... Um, what's that? Keep going. Okay. Sorry. But from a dirt standpoint, my feeling is the cheaper the better. Dirt is dirt. If you want to use worm castings, if you want to use uh, something with bat guano in it, and we'll cover bat guano in just a second. Yeah. That's cool, but... 
again, you're going to be putting in other things that are going to be more important than some of this other stuff. Frank was um, trying oh, to say that the creature soil is just peat moss. That's gotcha, what gotcha. Saying. So I'm going to get to peat moss in just a second as a filler type to your substrate. But most important is the dirt. Now, we're making a 15-quart container here. We're making a 15-quart. I'll let you hold it up. 15-quart, and I, I'm just going to give you some numbers of what I put in there just before the show. And the numbers are, if I can read them here, for uh, dirt, I put in 12 cups of dirt. 12 That's cups. 12 cups of dirt? That's 12 cups of dirt. It's actually 24 half cups, but... Yeah, that's 12 cups of dirt. Um, you didn't use a half cup. Hey, Stephen Moore, we're going to get that to that in just a second. And another part of the substrate, I keep saying that, but let me just go ahead and go through here. So we talked about dirt. Let me talk about the one other essential to your substrate. And this is something that, other than dirt, you have to have in your substrate before you do anything with additional uh additives to your substrate and that's leaves you have to add leaves absolutely i can't stress that enough and, and again these are detritivorous animals and they eat decaying materials now you can put other things in your uh substrate and that will break down leaf litter good job frank the other materials will break down, and obviously leaf litter isn't broken down immediately, but it breaks down pretty quickly. And I've talked to other individuals to say it takes a long, long, long time. I tell you what, after a couple of months, I've dug through and I've seen the leaf litter that I've added to the substrate broken down. So for our consideration, I'm looking for my numbers here, I put in, good gosh, I put in, where's the leaf litter? Mm -hmm. There's no leaf litter there? You have leaf litter. You didn't tell, tell me that. <clears throat> Barbara says I'm constantly adding leaf litter. So for leaf litter, I think that was four cups, if I remember right. Is what kind four? of measuring cup no, are you using? No, I'm sorry. It's two cups. I used a half cup. It's two cups. Doing the math here. So... Obviously, leaf litter is my number two essential ingredient to your substrate. Go ahead and add it. And we, we're not going to mix it up just yet. We're going to put in a couple of other things before we uh, stir the pot here and, and bake it up. Um, I'm going to go back to a point about the dirt. Can you use dirt from outside? I don't suggest it because there's just so much other stuff in there. And you again, you can go out to a home improvement store and buy a bag of dirt for what's what's a bag of dirt running now? Five bucks, ten bucks at the most. So three bucks, three bucks. Let's say five. Let's round it up to five dollars. So it's not much. Grab a, a forty pound bag of dirt, and that'll suffice for many, many, many enclosures. Okay. So Gamma L says, what is your favorite leaves for substrate? I tend to use oak or magnolia as that grows naturally here in South Carolina. I'm a huge fan of doing both. So what I like to do is use some hardwood. My nose is itchy. I try to use some kind of a hardwood leaf that will break down quickly. Now, I don't know if you saw those leaves, but... Uh, Wait till you hear this one. So those leaves... I ground up with a leaf cutter. So I bought kind of an industrial leaf cutter that grinds it down to just almost dust. And I did that because we had at one point this spring, I think it was like 40 of those big industrial size garbage bags. I don't know how many, how many gallons were those? I don't know, but you couldn't park the car in the garage. Is that a problem? Yeah. It was your it car. Was for me. It was for me. So, um, I bought one of those industrial size grinders, leaf cutters, and now, you know, we cut it down to probably the size of one-tenth of what they were taking, probably less than that. So what I just did was put in two cups of leaf litter in this mix, but that's all ground up, and that's going to break down a lot quicker than uh, if you just put in leaves. I always crumble them up. It helps the, the process break down as well. Um, 
So you want leaves that will break down quickly, but then you want some leaves that will take a little bit longer to break down. And I'm going to talk about some other ingredient in just a minute about the breakdown process. You want something breaking down in that um, process as quickly as possible and then something extended. So those magnolia leaves will tend to break down at a slower rate than oak or maple. I love maple leaves. So I hope that answers your question. Stop talking for a couple of minutes and yep. answer the questions on leaves. Okay. Angie, we get our leaves in our backyard because we do not treat our yard with any chemicals. So we make Jordan go out and bag the leaves. Okay. Okay. Can we use leaves from safe house plants, spider plants? Uh, what is a porno plant? Oh, pot, is that a pothos plant? Um, um, I don't want to make this show like R or X rated, so I'm going to skip that one. No, um, you can. I just, I just feel go yeah, out to a park, and I know this is tough for some people. I, I said park. this so casually to somebody at once at one point, and they came back and said that they don't have any parks or any ability to get leaves if we're in the middle of like New York or Los Angeles. Um, so. I'm not, Doug, I'm not even going to show that. Um, so <laughs> so I, I assume that everybody had access, and I know that's really tough. But there's a lot of sites where you can get oak leaves um, or maple leaves for isopods. I would spend the money and get them. If, if you can't collect, uh, do that. Rather than trying different leaves, somebody said, somebody had asked me about cactuses and, and a couple of other, I tell you, I get so many questions about isopods, and I get all of these different, can I try this can I try that? I just, what I typically say is I've not tried it. Set up a colony of powder blues and put them in there and give it a shot and let me know so that I can share the information as well. Just make sure if you go to a park though that you're going to a park that you know is not treating with fertilizers. Absolutely. I mean, you don't want anything that's been treated or pesticide, you know, pesticide, pest pesticide, pest pesticide, free. Free. pesticide free. Um, I'm gonna have to polish my nails again now. Look at this. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. Me too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what was I think? Oh, oh baking, baking. Uh, uh, Barry said that they that you bake your leaves, and that's really a good point. And we're not going to talk about decor, but you can certainly bake your leaves and bake the wood that you collect. Um, Two twenty-five ish for a half hour should do it. We put all of our stuff. And black bags and let them sit in the sun for about three months and that pretty much cooks them like crazy um so dead zucchini or tomato plants and or leaves mm -hmm. i would say put put try it i've not tried it i would say stick with hardwood leaves if you can if you can't find them try to buy them if you can't buy them try this and see you know how it works. Um, Frank says I usually bake these 250 to 275 for an hour. Holy cow, man! You gotta watch them to see. Yeah, yeah, just them. absolutely watch them so that it you know it doesn't burn down your house. Um, JP is lizard world. I'm gonna get back to my presentation in just a second, but uh, I am able to get a lot of pesticide fertilizer free leaves, but they're maple leaves. You said, but that's perfect. Maple leaves are perfect. My dairy cows eat them, like. Uh, if it was just candy. Absolutely. Maple leaves are probably my favorite. Oak is oak and maple leaves. Okay. So we talked about leaves. Uh, we talked about hardwood leaves. Um, but also there's another type of oak, a live oak uh, leaf. It's a smaller leaf. And again, mix up your leaves if you can do this and have one that will break down really quick and one that will take a little bit longer. I just hated the live oak leaves. They're just a smaller oak leaf. They're more oblong. <clears throat> but I found that um, actually they broke down slower. So it was easier, you know, to, to put in a couple of them and have one break down and be eaten all the time and these others to be kind of nibbled on. So I thought that that was a really, really good idea. Um, when you get the leaves, Angie, this is a really good question, and this is why we bake them. When you get the leaves from outside, you are you not worried about uninvited bug, bugs? So you can either bake them, like Phoebe already mentioned, uh, or you can throw them in black bags like we do and just let them sit outside and bake in the sun. Um, 
I didn't want to get into foods, but I'm going to for random tea. Um, shed snake skin is my uh, isopods favorite food. They eat it like prawns, I'm sure. But be concerned if ever you spray for mites because I've seen whole cultures lost because people were feeding their isopods snake skin and they had sprayed for mites and it killed everything. Okay. Means um, I wanted to throw in a quick thank you to all of our members on Buy Me a Coffee. Everybody that's sponsoring Supreme Gecko through Buy Me a Coffee, link is in the description. Thank you much. That's helping with all the likes that we have here. This is almost like a movie. I could be like, well, other than my looks, I could be like Brad Pitt in a movie with all these lights and cameras and everything going. It's crazy. No, um, no? did you say no? No, we are not having a movie theater. Okay. Toby says, uh, what are your thoughts on picking lot, living, growing leaves, and adding them to the substrate, then letting them die and break down naturally? As long as you're baking or, you know, making sure well, that they're, they're okay. As long, well, when you, you pick them, they're, them. they're not, you know, they're going to die. I think that that's good, but you absolutely have to have, you know, the dry, decaying leaves in your enclosure. If you want to add those so that those break down later, that's really cool. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the next ingredient. And now I'm, these ingredients I don't consider essential. Now there's going to be some controversy with that. I feel like if you start your enclosure with dirt and leaves, some decaying wood, and you can certainly throw wood into that mix like we just talked about the leaves, but what you're doing is uh, adding organic decaying material. Um, but you can also shave up wood and that would work as well. But from this point on, all of this is great additive stuff, but it's not, from my understanding, or from my perspective, it's not essential. And the first one there is, if I miss somebody, just go ahead and mention I'm it. I'm yelling at you when I see All it. right. Okay. Um, good filler material. Somebody mentioned peat moss. Now, peat moss is... I would consider one of the, it's not terrible, terrible, but I just wouldn't use peat moss. Peat moss is, does anybody know why you maybe shouldn't use peat moss? Has anybody heard anything about why peat moss really shouldn't be used in isopod enclosures? I'm going to get back to that. If you can think of a reason why you shouldn't use peat moss in the substrate for an isopod enclosure, let me know. Um, coil, core, core fiber, C-O-I-R fiber. Again, it's used sometimes. I see some people saying that they use uh, cray fiber. I don't, uh, simply because I use another product that I feel is a little bit better. Peat moss needs a lot of water, yes. So peat moss will hold moisture really, really well, and that's a good thing. You want your substrate, your your moisture areas in there, your substrate to be um, holding moisture, but the problem with peat moss, I'm not seeing, seeing the, the thing that I'm looking for. The problem with uh, peat moss is, oh, here we go. So Catherine Bowman says non-sustainable. Uh, please Sustain. don't. Sustainable. Please don't use peat moss. I, I agree with that. So why is it not sustainable? Why is that, Catherine? Do you know? Um, so peat moss is a great plant toilet peat peat moss is a great plant substrate but it's not a good isopod substrate i'm going to relate this story with aquarium fish most aquarium fish do great at uh, medium ph uh, ph base is uh seven the lower the ph the more uh ammonias can build up and the quicker the lower the ph the quicker fish can die because of ammonias it's the same thing in isopod enclosures. The lower that pH is in an isopod enclosure, the more animals, the, the more waste, the more buildup of ammonias. And you can take down a full colony just like that because of the ammonia buildup and the, the cause could be um, lower pH. So peat moss, is what did i see peat moss is a three to a 3.5 uh, ph and again neutral is seven so that's that's and that's extremely low and it doesn't break down good point um 
I want to put this up there too. Doug says sphagnum moss is going to hold it over time so much better. Absolutely agree. Now, be concerned that sphagnum moss is a little bit lower in pH as well, but it just doesn't break down as quickly as peat moss does. So it won't um, impact the substrate. Most people that add, uh, add sphagnum moss won't add sphagnum moss as a huge percentage of your total enclosure uh, substrate. So what we use instead, and I'm not saying this is the best, I'm just saying that it's working for us. We use a product, and, and I'm not sponsored by Zilla at all, but we use a product called Zilla's Jungle Mix. And Jungle Mix, I've got it down here, I just want to mention, Jungle Mix is aged Douglas fir bark and sphagnum moss. Now, Douglas fir bark is a little bit lower in pH as well. That's why we don't throw a bunch of Jungle Mix in there at all. And I'm looking for the... Uh, how much we filled with jungle mix. I should have written this down before, but um, I put in, I want to say eight cups. It was four cups of jungle mix. So did I go ahead and throw some jungle mix in? Throw it or just pour it? I'm going to be uh, doing a uh, talent search for <laughs> the next show that we do here. Oh, good luck on that one. They'd have to tolerate you to do that. They would have to do that. So so I like Jungle Mix. I've tried other products, and Jungle Mix is just a good blend. Now, if you How many look cups at was that? that was uh, four cups. So it's a pretty key part of this whole substrate uh, component, but it's not the substantial part. Now, sometimes I'll go a little bit lighter on that, sometimes a little bit more depending on the isopods. Here's a key point I'm going to throw in the middle of all of this. As you notice, if you could hold this up just for a second, then that. Like this or like this? Um, more like this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab it real quick here. Or you can drop it. Toward me. So you can see that the substrate, well, we've got some high end here, but you can see the substrate is about an inch and a half or so right now. That's probably a key point that a lot of people miss. They make their substrate not deep enough. And substrate should be at least an inch and a half to two inches. Uh, Cubaris, I've been told, should have substrates that are four or five inches deep because they burrow. Giant Canyon should have substrate that's four or five inches deep. Um, so depth is really, really super important. A lot of people miss that. All right. What else can you throw in there? Well, you can throw in a lot of people add orchid bark. We've stopped doing that. You can add charcoal, and we do add charcoal, small pieces. I don't have any charcoal broken down, unfortunately, to demonstrate, but you can throw in a cup of charcoal broken down. You, If you can find orchid bark that's not treated, doesn't have fertilizers, doesn't have artificial coloring or, or flavoring or anything like that, you can use orchid bark in your substrate. The only problem, well, what the benefit is that it adds kind of aeration. It, forms little pockets and I can't tell you how many times I've been digging for like giant canyons or some other small uh, let me get this one on the screen some other small uh, isopod and they burrow down and they're just clinging to the pieces of orchid bark or the charcoal so really really good to have them in there um, but you really have to be careful of the orchid bark and you uh, wanted to know if it's okay if it's deeper than the two inches sure you know there's, there's a um, point where you just give up value. So if it's three feet deep, you know, they're not going to use the third foot of that substrate. They're probably only going to, you know, depending on this isopod, they're only going to be using two, three, four inches of the, the substrate. Um, Cubaris, like rubber duckies, will burrow in. They'll go deep. Uh, giant canyons will go deep. He'll be saying good night. Good night, Toby. Thanks for joining us. Thanks no, for the Frank. really good questions. What's that? Frank wants to go four hours. No, we're not going to go four hours. We're going to go about another 20 minutes here because I've yeah. got about two more points here. So we talked about charcoal. And charcoal, why would you use charcoal? Well, I just mentioned one of the benefits is that it gives little pockets, like little homes for the isopods where they can gather around. Um, but that's not the key. Why, does, why do people use charcoal in aquariums? 
Yeah. Crystal, you should know this. If you have filters, outside filters that you're using charcoal in, you know, the filter medium, and do you know what that that charcoal does for the aquariums? By chance, I'll give Crystal a second. She might not know this. This is kind of technical, yeah, tricky. Emily Aquarium filter charcoal could be used. Absolutely. What's Hi, that? Emily. Hi, Emily. I don't see Emily on. No, that's because I missed it. Up. Yep, you missed it. I was trying to tell you. You're not listening. What, did you see something? So, um, charcoal. Why, what, why is charcoal an important part of an isopod setup? Because they can hide. You just said Because that. they can hide, but what else? What's the main feature of charcoal? Okay. The main feature of charcoal is it purifies. Yes, absolutely. What, and what do you mean by purifies, Barb? Is this like a pop quiz? Yes, this is a pop quiz. And I'm scoring. For Springtail <laughs> Sabreon, Emily, you, I could go an hour on that. Uh, and not in a good way. Filters out chemicals, absolutely. What kind? I'm, I'm not going to keep quizzing. So, <laughs> nitrogen. Yeah, oh my goodness. Outstanding. So, Thank charcoal, yeah, absolutely. Great job, guys. And girls. So charcoal remo removes impurities for fish in the water. It takes out um, things that cause ammonia spikes. So it purifies water. Absolutely. So it does the same thing in substrates for isopods. The thing is that if you're doing everything right, you real and you're watching your substrate and you're changing when you should be, it really doesn't. It's not really required to um, have. Charcoal, and it certainly doesn't hurt, and it can benefit. Uh, Barb, it, the, the charcoal doesn't kill the bacteria, but it promotes the things, it, it filters because it's so porous, and it promotes the things that do kill the bad that bad bacteria. Very, very important. Uh, am I missing anybody? Can we hit 30 likes? We don't have 30 likes yet? I'm going to stop talking until we have 30 likes. <laughs> okay, no, I can't do that. So... Charcoal is really, really good. Uh, I talked about orchid bark. Make sure that you don't get treated orchid bark. No additives whatsoever. Um, orchid bark is really, really good for diggers. Calcium. Who said calcium? I already lost the comment. Somebody said calcium. Like way, way, way back. So calcium is really important because um, isopods obviously are crustaceans, and crustaceans have shells. Do any crustaceans not have shells? So isopods have shells, and they build up the shells through, obviously, an intake of calcium. So what we do is, am I missing any, any ingredients? I did miss an ingredient. Okay, I'm just doing what I'm told when I'm told. <laughs> this is true. Um, so I'm going to get back time. to these two in just a second. But calcium is important as an additive in your enclosure. And I we do a couple of different ways of... Uh, providing calcium. <laughs> One is to take eggshells, grind them up, and put them on the side of the enclosure. And the isopods tend to eat the. Uh, I'm not tired of the net. No, oh, I'm tired of you, he said. Uh, yes, yeah, probably it. Um, so the calcium we put on the side of the substrate on top for the isopods to get to, but we also put the calcium in the. Uh, and the substrate as well for two reasons. Number one, for the isopods benefit so that they can get down in there when they dig and they can take in the calcium. Also, um, well, I've got to show this. I'm going to get back to this one. So also, we do it because calcium neutralizes pH as well. It's a pH buffer. Very, very, very important. I keep talking about pH, and if you don't know about pH, low pH is acidic, high pH um, is more base. The more acidic uh, a substance is, the more, especially for our isopods, for our fish and, and other animals, the more, the lower the pH, the more likely it's going to cause problems, especially things like ammonia. Uh, Emily, well, do you do that in every enclosure? Just some. I do calcium in every single enclosure. So we'll add calcium. You can go, go ahead How and much? put calcium. I don't know. I lost my it? notes here. Don't tell me a know. cup. Okay, it's two good. tablespoons. That was a true measurement. Um, I'm impressed. Yes. Whoops. We have the wrong one. Okay. 
So here's a trick. So we got away from using cuddle bone a long, long, long time ago. Um, do isopods need cuddle bone? I think that they need the calcium. So we've been using uh, the eggshells ground up, but we also take calcium bicarbonate uh, for human consumption. I tell you what, you can get a bag. I just looked just a couple of minutes ago. You can get a five pound bag of human grade calcium bicarbonate off of Amazon for 16 bucks. A five pound bag, and, and we use it for our geckos. Calcium, I'm telling you folks, calcium is calcium. Calcium is calcium. If it's human grade calcium, it's good for anything. So you can get calcium in limestone, you can get calcium in cuddle bone, you can get calcium in eggshells. Calcium is calcium. So we buy this five pound bag for 16 bucks and it lasts us for like a year. And that's with the geckos too. Huge tips, huge money saving tip there. It's that bag I sent you a picture of. Oh, okay. Um, so calcium, I think, is important in the substrate, and I put a little. We put a little pinch on the sides of the enclosure. How much charcoal do you put in? How much charcoal? Usually, I'll put in, um, like maybe a couple of cups of charcoal. Not much, just enough to kind of give the the whole mix a little bit of charcoal in there. Uh, I don't want the substrate overpowered with the amount of uh, charcoal that you're adding. Okay, what about the stuff you missed? Okay, the stuff that I missed. Here's a key point that I started doing when we started doing um, isopod setups, and this came from Russ Wilson from our, uh, Permax Pets. And my gosh, you know, if you're, you're not familiar with, hopefully nobody is not familiar with his, his YouTube streams because they're, they're the best. So I started putting together our uh, substrates based off of a recipe that he got from somebody, and I don't know their name, but it included uh, pellets that are used in like barbecues and grills, you know, to to give flavor. Flavor, yes. But these pellets don't have any additives to them. Um, let me go ahead and throw that in. So. You take a bag, you dump a bunch in a, a plastic uh, container, you throw water in, it breaks down, and then you get this almost like sawdust. So I, my thought was, oh, it breaks down, it's giving them more you know, nutrients, more resources in the substrate. I still use this, and how much was that? That was, I don't know. I, don't know. I was going to ask you. That was, that was a cup. So we'll throw a cup in in our substrate. I use it, again, because I want things breaking down quick, like those leaves that are almost dust, and I want things that are going to break down in five or six months. I've been told that this stuff never, ever, ever breaks down in a substrate, and I, I tend to disagree with that in that I've, again, gone through substrates uh, after five, six, seven, eight, nine months, and I, I don't see the pellets. I don't see any resemblance of anything other than you know, dirt and isopod waste. So my thought is that it's good to add it. It's not an essential part. It certainly helps um, in the long term. It helps extend the life of your substrate. Okay, Frank says oak wood pellets from Home Depot without additives are perfect to add to the substrate. Yes, they are. Again, you know, they're going to help extend the life. It's not going to be something that the isopods are going to start benefiting from like right now, it just isn't. What's this? Okay, what's this? This is garden line. So this is two tablespoons of garden line. Sometimes I throw one tablespoon in. What is garden line? I'm going to say it again. It battles the pH. So again, we're throwing a lot of different stuff in in this enclosure in the substrate. A lot of things like peat moss and uh, sphagnum moss, I should have said sphagnum moss, are going in there. I just said that. Great minds think alike. Um, so the garden line is going to battle that and keep the substrate buffered from a pH factor, from, from a pH standpoint, if that makes sense. So we'll throw a couple of uh, tablespoons in, and that's... Go back up a little bit. Yeah. Up, up. 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, absolutely frank. Uh, oak wood pellets from Home Depot. Somebody wanted to know what the name was. Oh, just ask. Just yeah. you know, go on their site and look for look at the ingredients. I can't, you know, with again, additives. we get this a lot as far as is this okay in my isopod enclosure? And I keep saying, you know, as long as it doesn't have fertilizers, if, as long as it doesn't have additives, if it, if it doesn't have added, you know, uh, uh, coloring and flavoring, uh, you should be good. We got people meeting each other in your oh, life. Cool. This is like uh, meet up with that each other. No, swipe off or swipe yeah. Yeah. Buff or something. No, no. Um, no. I we just live at the I same time. I saw buddies. Wait, that's already taken. Okay. So I just talked about the garden line, Emily, right on with the garden line. Um, so you had a point about the cuddle bone. I hope I kind of addressed that. And my goodness, I'm going to say it because I've said it all, all the time, all over the place. If you're doing something and it works for you, don't change because Wally said, oh, don't use cuddle bone. Don't do that. So I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about how much uh, crusted gecko diet to feed crusted gecko adults. And we finally got to the point, the thought was that I was wasting a lot of diet. I kept saying, my animals are eating that much. If it works for you, if it works for you, make sure you don't change. Hi, good, Seth. Good gosh. If, if I tell you to stop using cuddle bone, and, and I'm not, but if you're breeding, you know, rubber, rubber duckies, you know, by the boatloads, uh, don't stop, you know, because I said something. So hopefully... No, no, I'm not. I'm not. If you're doing something and it's working, don't change it because I'm saying something. Um, Gretel Growl. Gretel Growl. I'm Guru. Guru. Uh, will charcoal harm reptiles? I'm keeping a new box turtle on a bioactive. And I was wondering if I should add it to the subject. Uh, I don't know. Um, Charcoal won't hurt them. What I would do, though, is I would rinse it off first and get all that dust off the charcoal. Don't add that to um, any enclosure when you have all the dust. And I do that all the time. And a great point to bring up right now. If you can, make sure that you can rinse off. Uh, make sure you can rinse off that, that charcoal. I'm going to get back to that so. one in just a second. I want to talk about back wild. So... And this goes back to that whole um, cuddle bone discussion. If, it, if it's working for you, don't change it. You hear a lot of people talking about, you know, adding back bottle for uh, Cuberis, yeah. especially Cuberis rubber duckies. Should we do that? Should we buy a 60-pound no, bag? No, it's bad enough we feed them gecko poop and all that other garbage. What? You feed them gecko poop? I don't know. All that junk you save. Yuck. Um, That's gross. So back one, if it works for you, do it. If it doesn't work for you, or if you, if something isn't working, set up another enclosure and try some of your isopods in that other enclosure and see if that works for you. Um, Doug says, I use guano in mod moderation. Uh, Frank says, charcoal was actually used to help people vomit and other things. Wow. wow. Maybe just saying the word back guano helps people. Um, I missed something up here somewhere about, oh, is baking soda, oh, I can't remember, calcium, is baking soda calcium bicarbonate? I don't, it's high in base, so it might be, again, I can't suggest more, you know, this, this bag. It's, let me give you this name. It's Duda Energy's, Food grade, 97% calcium carbonate. Ground limestone, five pound bag for 16 bucks. Okay, I'm gonna get off of that topic. Back guano, again, I could talk about a hundred different things that I've heard about, some I've used. The one thing that I do wanna say is if you're using back guano, what I would not do are any organic food type, I guess back guano is in food. Is it? Maybe it is. I don't know. There's some disgusting. things it is. I wouldn't, I personally would not mix it in the substrate. You know, we talk about, you know, mold and mites and uh, fungus gnats all the time. I really, really, really think that 
you need to stay away from anything organic going into your substrate. Um, I thought about adding like a drag millworms in there, but I just don't want anything rotting in that substrate. You know, if in moderation you're doing it and it's working for you, again, good. Let's let's keep doing that. But um, your I looked this up on Google. Yeah. The um, baking sodium or baking soda is sodium bicarbonate, which is not the same at all as ah. calcium is what it says right on see i'm useful oh <laughs> that's okay way to go jason um but you're both right on cool okay i want to get to this one. Oh, oh where'd it go okay this is dog but i would use the bag while he's the i would use the bag it's cheap and has extra oh okay that's for the calcium uh, absolutely. Um, do you know anybody that uses clay-based substrates and how to uh, properly set them up? So if we're talking about isopods, no, and I'm not sure if there's a huge advantage to using a, a clay uh, uh, or a clay ingredient in your substrate. Now, if we're talking about uh, springtails, absolutely, and that's I think what a lot of people are going over to is this clay uh, substrate for spring kits. Clay with uh, other like calcium uh, components to it as it well. It doesn't get hard when you contact it though? We are just a couple of minutes to the end here. Sorry about reaching over through here. Um, other questions that I missed up here somewhere? Did I miss yes. any other ingredients? Are you, are you think, do you use, um, I missed what that was, random tea. I think it's the bat poop. And bat poop. Um, did I miss any questions? How's it going? Um, do you have any questions about your, your setups? Do Does everybody create their own substrates for your isopods? And did I miss anything? Uh, is RO water better than treated tap water? I'm, I've said this in a couple of other... Um, streams and videos but if you take water coming out of the tap and set it on the shelf for a day or two um, it, it should be fine you know what you're concerned about is um, oh the name's escaping me now but uh, chloride chloramine uh, check your city water find out you know what you have in it but uh, what you can do is set it aside on a shelf and all of those gases will evaporate and you should be able to use that water straight. I don't use RO because our water is hard and I think that that's an added component uh, in a little way. I don't know if that's, if it is or not, but you know, in my mind, it, it justifies. to know if you'll put the ingredient list up later on your page. What a great idea. In fact, I'll go back into this live stream and I will put the ingredients and the measurements uh, in cups, not half cups, uh, for everybody. Um, my dairy cows go nuts for the Arcadia food sticks. You know, I when I first started keeping isopods, that was the one thing that I was looking for, looking for these Arcadia food sticks. And I think that it's good stuff. I'm going to say again, you know, if you've got the calcium going and you've got, you know, some, some high protein foods going, especially for dairy cows, I don't know if one food is better than the other, you know, dried fish, shrimp, uh, dried up mealworms. Uh, they just need all of those, all of those additional proteins. I love the little condiment squeeze bottles like you'd use for ketchup. So good for just getting the right amount of water along the edges of the moist side. Uh, I like those too, like for ketchup and mustard, the, the taller with the, the spout. Um, what I've gone over to is, I don't even know how to, um, they have a certain name. It's a bottle with the, the the nozzle coming out and then pointing down. Somebody knows what this is, and I can't think of the name of it, but you can take the bottle and you can, you can take the bottle and it has a little, little like nozzle like this, and you can point it and you can squirt. I'm going to spill my soda all over. And then there you can you adjust to a certain area of the enclosure. It works out really well. And it's seven the o'clock. Lights went the off. fish lights just went off. We're going to go just a couple more minutes here, folks, and I'm going to get 
a couple of these. Hi, Ben. Uh, oh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. That's cool. Okay. Two more, and then we're going to call it a night. Uh, I'm in eastern Washington. I survive here native and not thriving in the high and dry, rocky climate here and surrounding the harsh winters and summers. Crazy. Is that inside? Is it in your care, or is it... Um, there we go. Is it in your care, or you mean outside? I'm sure the ones outside are burrowing in, hunkering down, and and uh, calling it a night for the winter. How often do you change the social in your bioactive reptile enclosures, if ever? Never, ever, ever. Uh, I never do. And I know some people have big reptiles, and they have lots of dwarf whites and lots of, like, powder blues. They never, ever change their substrate. Um, I guess over time, you know, a few years, you might want to. But um, for a bioactive reptile enclosure, I'm thinking you probably what you know. And we talked a little bit earlier about replacing your substrate. Let me emphasize very clearly that um, what you really want to do is every once in a while go in and change a little bit of your substrate. Take out 20 percent, 25 percent, and add new uh, substrate in there. That's actually the way to go. Um, any other questions? He okay. said outside he was talking Outside, about. yeah, I'm sure outside. Uh, I do it every six months for substrate changes out just in case. And that's cool. If it, again, if it works. Uh, GP's Lizard World, time to go. Oops, I think I missed one. My guest stories are due. Um, oops, I think I missed that one. No, no dance. That's, huh? No dance. No dance. Not tonight. Uh, Perry bottles, we use them in the hot Perry bottles. They're called a different name, and I can't think of, I don't know. Anyways, um, if there's no other questions, I hope this helped out. I'll add to the description and make sure that I have all the ingredients with the, the, uh, with the measurements and everything. Here it is all next up. Are uh, you going to do a live feed every week? So much fun. This is a lot of fun. And this is so, I tell you what, this was spreadsheet driven and it wasn't much. I was hoping for more interaction. I think that there was a great amount of interaction. Should I just they grab a handful and just show a handful? Yes. Can I see it with this? I don't one? think so, but I can maybe do this and spill it all over. Don't, don't. So I don't know around. if people can see that. But that's pretty much what it looks like. And you can see that it's mostly dirt with some of that jungle mix. And you can see the calcium, the white in there. Uh, you can certainly see the leaves. Hopefully that helps. Um, so lives, I think that we'll probably try to start doing them once or twice a month. And I'm I'm going to set up a, a specific time. So You're gonna again, this was all off of spreadsheet. So it wasn't really ad hoc at all. I like the ad hocs too. So we certainly will. Uh, thank you. You're amazing. Have an awesome weekend. We have a full weekend ahead. So thank you very much. We have a concert. We have a, a guest football game. We just all kinds of stuff going on. I hope everybody has a great weekend. Uh, thank you again for coming and, and sharing your Friday evening with me. And Nanette, I really appreciate it. I'm going to go do my nails. It. Go do your nails. I think I have to do my hair. Uh, we'll see you all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, all.